Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third of our virtual histories um, series presented by Baltimore Heritage and the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. I'm Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage, and I'm going to be your virtual MC. I guess that's the right term uh, today from my uh, second floor room this time. Um, and I'm thrilled that today we've got Nathan Dennis, who actually is as our speaker, who is, is with the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. Uh, but before introducing him, um, I would like to say a sincere thank you uh, to everybody for first tuning in, and then second, for those of you who have contributed uh, in whatever amount today, uh, in these uh, really crazy coronavirus times, um, all of the in-person uh, events that the Baltimore Architecture Foundation and Baltimore Heritage had planned on doing have been canceled. And, uh, and your support through this virtual uh, series is really, really fantastic. Thank you. Um, one more introduction is uh, just a plug for the next speakers. Uh, next Friday, we've got Meg Fairfax Fielding, um, who is just a, a super architectural sleuth. Um, she's going to be talking about uh, or leading us on an architectural safari through Baltimore. And then on May 29th, we've got uh, Baltimore historian and architect extraordinaire, uh, or architecture buff extraordinaire, Charlie Duff, uh, walking us through some neighborhoods in Baltimore that were inspired by the Garden City movement. Um, all right, now for on to Nathan. We're going to go lickety split here. Um, Nathan Dennis is the associate director of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. Um, he also serves as the chair of the Greater Hamden Heritage Alliance, um, and he's on the board of the Friends of the Jones Falls, the Baltimore City Historical Society, um, and the Greater Baltimore History Alliance. Um, Nathan has spent years researching uh, the Jones Falls, and I will dare say he knows more about uh, its history than anybody on on planet Earth. Uh, it's thr I'm thrilled to, to be able to sit and listen with all the rest of us on this. Um, and on to Nathan with one more little uh, uh, housekeeping matter. If you'd like to ask any questions, please use that little chat bubble um, down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and we're going to hold them until uh, uh, after about 20 minutes or so and get to as many as we can at the end. And with that, I will turn it over to Nathan. Uh, thank you, Johns, for that great introduction. Um, I'm happy to be able to present about the history of the Pullen Hunt Ironworks to Clipper Mill today. Um, and so this presentation is going to take us from uh, 1853 to the present day, and we'll be looking at how the site has evolved over time as Pullen Hunt's business expanded and developed, um, and after the site was sold off to new manufacturing and then was eventually uh, adaptively uh, reused for uh, apartments, condominiums, an award-winning re restaurant, and uh, various other kinds of small manufacturing. So we're going to start at the beginning, and this is just a little bit about the history of, of what Pool and Hunt did. Uh, so the company was founded by uh, an Irish immigrant named Robert Poole, and Robert Poole uh, immigrated to Baltimore at a young age, and he apprenticed uh, at textile mills and also uh, with the railroad industry. So he was able to uh, gain some insights into the industries that he would be uh, supplying machines for later in life. And he began with establishing uh, his first factory in 1843 um, in Baltimore near Guilford and Franklin Streets. And you have you, this advertisement gives you an idea of the sorts of things that they were making. Uh, Pool and, what became Pool and Hunt became the largest ironworks in the state of Maryland, and they were making all sorts of interesting things, uh, primarily for the railroad industry. So uh, you see that they were making wheels and axles, play car wheels, chilled tires. Um, they were making hydraulic presses. Uh, they were also making machinery for the textile mills. Uh, another big uh, manufacturing uh, thing for them was also steam boilers and water tanks. So they were in a lot of different uh, fields with, uh, with iron working. In 1853, their shop in Baltimore uh, burned down and they decided to begin relocating to Woodbury, which uh, at the time was a burgeoning mill town. Uh, and you see this is a photo from the mid 19th century. And this is looking at uh, Union Avenue uh, from Hamden. Uh, so you see what Union Avenue looked like in the mid-19th century, the bridge over the Jones Falls. Uh, here is uh, an old image of the Pool and Hunt site, and you also see the beginnings of Woodbury. This is Clipper Road where you have all of those uh, iconic stone houses. 
And just a quick note on the textile industry. Uh, the textile industry is really what Woodbury is known for. It's what the, the Jones Falls Valley is known for. The textile mill industry here, led by the Mount Vernon Company, at its peak at the end of the 19th century, controlled uh, upwards of 75% of the world's cotton duck manufacturing, which was a type of canvas that was primarily used for ship sales uh, throughout the 19th century. And this was a great location for Robert Poole to set up shop because one of his major clients would have been uh, the textile manufacturers. This is a really great lithograph image of what the Poole and Hunt site might have looked like in the 1880s. And it's just, a, it's a super crisp image. And I, and I love using this to explain how the site would have, be, would have been run uh, in the 1880s. Uh, so up front, you see this train here. That's the Northern Central Railroad. And that runs along what's now the light rail today. And that would have run between Baltimore and would have gone up through Pennsylvania. So being located right next to that railroad would have been a great, um, great location for Poland Hunt to be able to transport goods easily uh, between those states. And you also see that there's a rail spur that goes into the site so that it makes it easy for the company to load up cars to move out to the actual railroad tracks. Uh, close here is this very long, kind of stout building here is the original machine shop. This would have been built probably around um, 1853. It was 60 feet wide and 400 and, or 480 feet long. Um, and it was constructed out of a type of locally quarried stone called Baltimore Nice. And this is where they would have uh, used tools to shape all sorts of uh, machinery that they were making. Um, early on, Poole and Hunt were manufacturing rail cars for the B&O, the Cumberland, and the Pennsylvania Railroad. And uh, not long afterwards, uh, they built this blacksmith shop, which is probably from around 1854, 1855. And the blacksmith shop was important for a few reasons. Um, it was also made out of Baltimore Nice, and there were tw about 22 forges that were here um, that were used to shape iron, including making and repairing all of the tools that uh, the company would have been using in its manufacturing. And then right next to, to it here is the foundry. And so this is where they would have fed these two massive cupolas that they would have been using to melt down iron and then use the melted iron for cast iron uh, uh, manufacturing. And you would what you would have is you would have items being cast over here and then and then being transferred over to the machine shop on the other side. And if I zoom in a little bit here, see if I can actually get this to work, uh, you can get a closer view of what some of these buildings would have looked like. Um, this is an interesting piece here. This is like some kind of derrick, I think, that would have been used to lift objects onto uh, the, the cars that were going out to uh, the railroad or to lift objects between the foundry and the machine shop side. Um, and then here's this, this uh, little station that um, would have been used for loading up the cars. And then up front here is the original office building. And so this is where you would have had the administrators working. Um, Robert Pohl's office was probably somewhere in here. You also would have had the draftsmen and the, and the pattern makers uh, working in that building as well. Um, and so this is a great image of what the site would have looked like really at the peak of, of uh, Pohl and Hunt. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, they were the largest ironworks in the state of Maryland, and they employed upwards of around 800 people. Here are some images of some of those buildings up close. So this is the blacksmith shop, uh, what it looks like today. Um, you see that there's this brick addition that was added at some point um, during the life cycle of the building. This is the original machine shop. The machine shop burned down in, this, in a horrendous fire in the 1990s. Uh, but this is what it would have originally looked like. You see the dark stone um, that's so uh, apparent around Woodbury and around uh, places along the Jones Falls. And this is an old photograph of the erecting shop. And the erecting shop was built around 1890. So if you think about the machine shop being built in around 1853, this came several decades later. And it really demonstrates an expansion in what the company was building. The erecting shop was made to build large machines and large objects. 
Uh, you could, it had an 80 foot clearance. It's, it's a massive building. And you see also this clear story with all of these windows here as well. Um, and so, so it was really important uh, to be able to let in as much natural light as possible. And then next to it here is the old foundry building. And then uh, here is, uh, it's a parking lot today, but it was originally uh, a, a yard that was used for um, just storing all sorts of different things. This is uh, an image of what the office became. So the original office was a much different Victorian building like we saw uh, back here. And then sometime, I think in the 1890s, they tore it down. And then in the early 20th century, they replaced it with this uh, classical revival three-story office building. This is an image of the wagon house uh, and stable. And so the company would have used, before the days of cars, they would have used horses, workhorses to move things around the site and to help to move items that needed to be loaded up onto the rail cars. And this is a really interesting building um, that's still there today. <clears throat> and also another thing that the company did was provide housing for its workers. So these are a few houses up in Brick Hill uh, and many of Poole and Hunt's workers would have lived in Brick Hill and uh, the company would have built uh, many of the houses up here. Here is an image of the old general store, uh, which is still standing today. It was an all purpose uh, shop for, uh, for anything the community, the people in the community might need. It was also functioned as a town hall and also a post office. And Robert Poole helped to uh, build this along with um, funding the church in the neighborhood. And he also um, helped to fund a school for apprentices. One distinction between Poole and Hunt and the textile mills, um, you see one of the old textile mills here, which is Woodbury Mill, is that the textile mills uh, employed largely, uh, largely women and they were paid very little uh, for their labor. The people working at Poole and Hunt were considered skill laborers and would have made something more akin to a living wage. Uh, here is uh, some of the things that they would have been making at uh, Poole and Hunt throughout the 19th century. One of the products they were really proud of and one of their best sellers was this uh, double, uh, level double turbine water wheel, which they sold to mills um, all over the country. Uh, next to it is an uh, image of a loom that would have been used in textile mills during the period. <clears throat> Perhaps the most impressive thing that the company manufactured was the columns for the peristyle of the Capitol building dome in Washington, D.C. Uh, you see the Capitol building being constructed here. These columns would have been cast at the Poole and Hunt site, and Poole and Hunt also uh, manufactured the machines that were used for the construction of the Capitol building, such as you see in the background here, <clears throat> and also manufactured a lot of the structural elements for the Capitol building itself. <clears throat> One of the interesting things about the project was they won the bid because they bid lower than anyone else, <clears throat> but the project went on for a while and the administration changed, and when the administration changed, they decided to fire Poole and Hunt and, and start to use a company that was based out of New York that had the political connections to the new administration. So while Poole and Hunt didn't manufacture all the columns of the Capitol building dome, they did have a significant role in its construction. Um, and then moving on into the 1880s, uh, Poole and Hunt started getting into the cutting edge of uh, cable car uh, manufacturing and they were manufacturing these really impressive cable driving plants and here's a cross section of one. Um, I don't know exactly where this is but you'd, you'd see these there's several kinds of buildings like this around Baltimore and it's just like the machinery that was used to power these cable cars was really impressive and Poole and Hunt were manufacturing these uh, cable car plants um, up and down the east coast and into the midwest. And then next to it is an image on the cover of Scientific American. It's a giant sand wheel that Poole and Hunt manufactured for the Calumet and Hecla Mining Company. Uh, it was one of the largest machines of its period um, and was considered a marvel at the time that they were able to manufacture this giant 65 foot diameter wheel. 
uh, here in Baltimore and then get that over to Michigan. And it got the company a lot of press. And this would, would have been made in that giant erecting shop with that 80 foot clearance. <clears throat> and uh, before I move on, I wanted to just give a recap about how the site has changed over time using some atlases and maps from the period. Uh, so here is an image of Woodbury in the early 1860s, it's 1862. And you see here uh, that pool and hunt has been established after starting here in 1853. You see the long machine shop, uh, the foundry, and the blacksmith shop. Uh, here you also see Brick Hill has been established. Um, and then you have the textile mills and uh, the mill village adjacent to that. Then we move to 1877 and we see that the machine shop has a few new extensions. Uh, there's been extensions made to the blacksmith shop and to the foundry um, and the office building appears to be much larger and they've also added a new boiler shop across the tracks here so as as the company was growing they were uh, creating more extensions to the buildings they had and they were also starting uh, to build new buildings on this site and you see how massive this site is too so they pool and hunt had all of this land backing all the way up to parkdale um, and one of the interesting things about this period is that there was actually a pond over here um, as well. But by 1897, the pond is gone. Uh, we see the stable slash wagon, uh, wagon storage building over here. And the biggest new addition is that giant erecting shop that's been added to the site as well. And you also see some more additions to the foundry building um, and the machine shop and the smith shop. And uh, so we're going to be going into the 20th century now. Uh, Robert Poole, um, by the end of his life, he died in 1903, had become a millionaire after immigrating uh, to Baltimore from Ireland with nothing. Um, and after his death, it, the company continued um, under the name Poole Engineering and Machine Company. And uh, after this time, um, Moving into the 1910s, uh, the United States is, is starting to enter uh, World War I uh, by, um, the end, by the end of that decade. And also, Poole and Hunt is seeing an opportunity for uh, some wartime commissions. And they build this building here that's uh, now known as a tractor building, but was originally called the erecting shop number two. And this was a building they built for the manufacturing of all sorts of things related to the wartime effort. Um, one of the things that they made here were these uh, artillery mountings for uh, US naval destroyers. And um, moving on uh, to that, I, sorry, my slides got a bit mixed around here. Here's a photo of what the site would have looked like in the 1910s. Uh, here is another image looking into the site. Um, and then moving forward into the Second World War, uh, we have the Franklin Balmer Company. So during the Great Depression, uh, Poole and Hunt down, had to downsize dramatically, and they ended up selling off their campus to Franklin Balmer Company, which was a company that was also manufacturing components for the railroad industry. Uh, but by World War II, they were uh, getting into aeronautics. Uh, you see this aircraft uh, being assembled here on site. And they were also commissioned uh, to manufacture components for the Manhattan Project, uh, i.e. the atomic bomb. Uh, they were also involved in manufacturing components for Liberty ships. And Franklin Balmer uh, stayed on site uh, for a while after that, but by the 1970s, um, the site was uh, being run by a cabinet manufacturer that wasn't really utilizing the full extent of the site. And then by the, toward the end of the 20th century, it had become this wonderful um, like artist complex. Uh, it also, uh, the old erecting shop with its massive 80 foot clearance was transformed uh, later on into a rock climbing gem. Um, but a particular interest was this collective of artists that were um, that had taken up in the old machine shop and other buildings on site. I have a photo here of the Amaranthian Museum uh, today, which has a lot of the works of artist Les Harris, who had created this incredible um, art experience of 
um, the history of Western civilization beginning with ancient Egypt up to Andy Warhol. Um, and you'd see his artwork just completely filling up the space. Unfortunately, and very sadly, a, a fire destroyed the site in the 1990s, uh, beginning, uh, I believe, in the, in the rock climbing gym and completely destroyed the south side of the campus. Um, and so here you see the aftermath of that. Uh, the old erecting shop is a burned out husk and the machine shop is completely destroyed. <clears throat> and uh, if you go to the site today, there's a memorial to a firefighter who lost his life battling the incredible blaze. Uh, that said, all hope was not lost. Uh, at the beginning, toward the beginning of the 21st century, um, there were plans drawn up by Strieber Brothers, Eccles and Rouse, along with Tobin Holbeck Architects to reimagine and adapt the site for new use. Um, and you see here the condominium building that uh, replaced the old machine shop, which was done in a very sensitive way to the history of the site and the existing buildings and done in a, in a scale with massing that is complementary to the building that was there before. And you also have now the Northern Central Railroad is no more, but you have the light rail now going um, up and down the old tracks and stopping right here in Woodbury. Here is uh, some photos of the transformation of uh, the erecting building, which like I showed before was a burned out husk. Uh, but what Chauvin Holbeck was able to do was to create this incredible apartment building uh, within the ruin of that. And um, you see how they, how they did this uh, transformation. It was a very creative project. Uh, and here's another photo of that. You see they also kept the old crane uh, from the inside of the building. Um, and an architecture office is also in there along with the apartments. This is what the old stable building was transformed to. It's the offices for biohabitats. And here is an image of the pool. So the pool was built in the, in the ruins of uh, part of the machine shop, which was used for, for pattern storage. And across from it, you see um, the old foundry, which was transformed into Woodbury Kitchen, as you see here. And then back further into the foundry is Gutierrez Studios. And one thing that I really love about the site today is that it still maintains its industrial legacy. So you have Gutierrez Studios uh, still on site manufacturing some really impressive uh, products out of steel, um, such as architectural elements like staircases uh, and even things like lamps and tables. Uh, and you also have Corridetti Glass Blowing Studio, which is keep, obviously keeping the fires alive in the old foundry building as well. Uh, the, the one remaining building on site that hasn't been uh, developed yet is the, the old tractor building. Um, and so here is a, some images of what that looks like today. Uh, there are currently plans that have uh, gone through for the redevelopment of this, of this building. And uh, so lots of new things potentially in the future of Clifford Mill, but I think I'm uh, coming up on my 30 minutes right now. I could go on for ages here, but I'd love to hear some questions from anybody. Thank you. John's, are you there? Oh, I think you're muted. Let me unmute you. John. Uh, th thank you. Yes. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> you, you can see we're, uh, we're still a little bit not quite high enough on the learning curve for this, but uh, um, we did get a couple questions. Um, let me start with the first Great. question, which was, on um, the lithograph slide, there showed some uh, a mansion, maybe actually more than one mansion, up on the hill uh, to the right. Do you know anything about the estates or the mansion that was up there? Yeah, sure. Uh, one of the mansions was was owned by the Hooper family, and the Hooper family uh, controlled the textile mills. They controlled the Woodbury Mill and also the. Um, uh, they eventually acquired most of the mills in the Jones Falls Valley, and that was one that was their mansion. There was also an estate on the site 
um, which I haven't been able to date. It's where um, I think it's it's being used as something called Alice Manor now in Woodbury, and it's, it's the buildings have been completely changed. Um, but I think at one point um, an architect lived there, Reuben Gladfelter, um, and he was responsible for um, the design of a lot of the mill buildings. Uh, in Woodbury. Robert Poole lived in a mansion on the other side of the Jones Falls, uh, near where the um, the Ace Academy School is today. Excellent. All right, next question was, do you know where the ore came from that powered the, uh, the, the industrial beast that was the mill center there? That's a, that's the quick question. And that's something that I haven't um, really looked into was uh, where the, where the ore deposits were. I know a lot about the deposits of things around the Jones Falls Valley, but not one of those things is not um, iron. Uh, so <laughs> they would, they were shipping it in from somewhere, <laughs> but I, I can't, I don't have an answer for that one. We'll, we'll, we'll get into it. Um, <laughs> another question was providing housing common at that time. Yes, it was very common. Um, so you would imagine Woodbury, uh, before the textile uh, industry moved there and before Pool and Hunt moved there, there wasn't much there. Um, and it was mostly just out beyond north of, of Baltimore City, north of North Avenue. Uh, it was mostly just these large estates uh, in the mid 19th century that ended up getting developed. And at the time in, in the 1850s, the site would have been in Baltimore County. And, and the way that it worked was, so let's use the textile industry as an example. So the, the company wants to build a large textile mill and they need hundreds of workers. And so they recruit these workers from areas around the state, uh, but they need a place to live. There's nowhere nearby the factory to live. And so what they do is they end up developing all the housing for the workers. So it's a, it ends up becoming a company town. And uh, Robert Poole was also developing housing. Um, for his workers as well. And so it's very common in the 19th century uh, for that. You see examples of it all over um, the country. Uh, one, one caveat of that is that it means that the owner of, of the factory has a lot more control over the lives of the workers. Um, you'd have the supervisors living in close proximity to uh, the regular laborers. Um, and also the company would have been providing all the amenities such as um, the churches, um, the stores, they would have different sorts of rules, like there couldn't be a, a, a bar or like a liquor store within a mile of any of the mills. Um, and so it was sort of restrictive in that, in that way as well. Right, so, well. Another question is how typical were these buildings at the time? I guess, I guess did, did Pool and Hunt look like any other industrial complex in, in Massachusetts or New Jersey at the time, or were, was this one a little bit different? I would, I would say that it's pretty similar to um, what you'd see elsewhere. Um, the, the template for the factory isn't something that really um, changes a whole lot. I think it like, like changes in, in style, depend, sometimes depending on region or, or depending on the time period. But the basic layout of a factory is something that is, is pretty common um, a, across various places you would look. I, I think a lot of it has to do with like just these buildings are made to be as, as efficient as possible. And they're also very beautiful with all of the large windows, something that's very desirable now um, to let in light so that people could work. But it really, the, the point of the, the design of these factories was to make sure that um, manufacturing could be done as efficiently as possible. And so you see factories looking very similar um, all over. But of course, every factory has its own quirks. Excellent. All right, we're going to try to get through a few more. We're going to run a, a tiny bit late, everybody. So if you want to uh, uh, click uh, click off, that's fine. But we're going to try to get through a few more questions here. Um, another one is, do you know who's developing the tractor building? Um, yeah, it's a company called Valstone. And the architect is, uh, it's two, there's two firms working on it, uh, Marin Architects and the Design Collective. Oh, I also just see an answer to a question. Uh, thank you, Tom Casey. Uh, it's about the iron question. It says that Pool and Hunt did not process iron ore, but would have purchased iron from an iron slash steel mill. And there was one in Ashland, north of Cockeysville that was moved to Sparrows Point. Thank you. <laughs> How about that for uh, uh, instant crowdsourcing? That's awesome. Um, Let's see, next one is, uh, was the site ever given historic status of any type? 
It's on the National Register, um, and uh, and and the tractor building is on the potential landmark list with chat. And so let me back up and explain um, how how like different historic protections work. Uh, so being on the National Register um, means that this like a site can have access to uh, tax credits, but it isn't actually protected locally. Um, and so the development of the site in the 2000s by Strieber Brothers, Eccles, and Rouse, they took advantage of a lot of tax credits to develop that site. And in order to access those tax credits, they would have had to uh, develop the site in a way that was uh, sensitive to the historic fabric. Uh, maybe we'll try to get to I'll have to note too that Woodbury is currently seeking a uh, a local landmark district with the city with with CHAP, which is the Commission on Historic Architecture and Preservation. And that is going to City Council on, I believe it's uh, next month, June 9th. So that's uh, some exciting news. <laughs> <laughs> go, go. Um, all right, two more here. Uh, it was the pool in Hunt's company. Whatever happened to Hunt? Uh, yeah, I, I, I took a lot of the slides out to, for the purpose of brevity. Um, about the history of the company. Uh, so German Hunt, he managed the business side of, of things. So Bauer Pool was the guy who was on site. Um, and then and German Hunt was was downtown in Baltimore handling all of the business, the business um, decisions and accounting and things outside. And he he retired from the company and uh, I'm gonna mess this up. I think it was sometime in the late 1880s. And at that time uh, Poole brought his son on board to help manage the company. And so the, the company changed from, um, it was originally called Poole and Ferguson before Hunt came on board, and then Poole and Hunt, and then Poole and Son, and then it, it, it went through various different names of like Poole Engineering Company. Um, I think here in this photo you see um, it says Poole and Hunt Founders and Machinists. Um, yeah, good question. Okay. Excellent. All right, last, last question. Um, do you know anything about who originally lived in the largest stone home on Clipper Road next to the playground, was that the house you said Poole lived in? <clears throat> no, the house Poole lived in was across the Jones Falls, um, up the hill, sort of near uh, Falls Road in Hamden. Uh, that, that building on the end of Clipper Road would have, I think that was, was uh, housing for a supervisor. Uh, Hooper had that other man, the more impressive mansion that was further up the hill in Woodbury. And that house would have been like one of the, the bigger supervisors um, on site. And so it again goes back to what I was talking about, about the development of, of these uh, company housing developments where you have the supervisors living in close proximity to the laborers. All right, I think we're gonna end there. We're, we're two minutes over, but uh, in this age of virtual everything, uh, we might not get the technology right, but we're gonna try to be punctual. So uh, thank you very much, Nathan. That was fabulous. Um, and thank you everybody uh, for tuning in and come back next week when we take an architectural safari with Meg Fairfax Fielding. So, all right, we're gonna end now and hope you have a good weekend. Thank you everybody.